This is part three of our introduction to modeling of ground heat exchangers. And uh, last time we looked at uh, the line source and the exponential integral. And so now we're going to... Um, that had got us to the point where we could, in theory, predict the temperature chain rise at the borehole wall. Then we talked about borehole resistance, which helps us then predict the fluid temperature. So if we put those together, the temperature at the borehole wall is uh, would be this portion here, this first term, like this. And this is the temperature rise at the borehole wall. Then the temperature rise at the uh, fluid, in addition to the rise at the borehole wall, is given by the uh, heat transfer rate, watts per meter or BTUs per hour per foot times the effect of borehole thermal resistance, right? That'll give us the delta T from the borehole wall to the um, mean fluid temperature. And then finally, the far field temperature, what I often call the UGT, undisturbed ground temperature. Um, we, get, we need that to give us the actual temperature of the borehole wall instead of just the temperature rise. So uh, again, the borehole fluid temperature here is the mean fluid temperature. This is the simple mean, mean of the entering and exiting temperatures. Um, and that's because we're using RB star here. If we just used RB, we'd be getting the actual mean fluid temperature, and then we'd have to work out from there what the entering and exiting were. Um, T is the time duration of the heat input. So this expression is still only good for one uh, fixed heat pulse, and we'll get to how to use it when the uh, heat input is changing. Again, the far TFF, our field temperature of the soil, or what we often call the UGT, undisturbed ground temperature. Uh, Q is still heat transfer rate per length. RBH is the borehole radius, often just abbreviated R sub B, little r sub B. So we have capital R sub B, the borehole resistance, little r sub B, the borehole radius. Oops. And finally, the soil thermal diffusivity and the conductivity of the soil, alpha and K, respectively. Okay, and then what we usually would like to know, depending on what we're doing, is we'd like to be able to predict the entering fluid temperature of the heat pump, right, or the equivalent to the borehole exiting fluid temperature. So the simplest approach, and this is usually only suitable for time steps down to around 15 minutes, that is to assume the borehole and fluid both are in quasi-steady state conditions, and then that the mean fluid temperature is the simple mean fluid temperature. Right? And if you want to go to shorter time steps, then you need a more sophisticated approximation. But to get started, this is an introduction, uh, we're just going to take this a simple approximation and we plan not to use it on short, very short time steps. So from the first law of thermodynamics, the total heat transfer rate to the borehole is the Q times the length of the borehole. So the watts per meter of borehole times the meters of borehole or BTUs per hour per foot times the feet. All right, that's the heat input. That's got to equal the mass flow rate of the fluid times the specific heat of the fluid times the temperature change across the borehole. I guess this would be a good place to point out that um, you know, since this is a heat transfer problem, we do have specific heats elsewhere, like the specific heat of the ground gets rolled into the thermal diffusivity, so you have to keep it straight from context, which we're using. But of course here, again, this is the energy change to the fluid going through the borehole. Okay, so we could solve this for delta T. It would be then QL, the total heat, put, heat input divided by M dot Cp. All right, and then delta T over two would be the temperature difference between the simple mean fluid temperature and the borehole exiting fluid temperature. All right, so it would be given by this expression. So if we um, put this in and we recast our temperature or our, our um, expression for the temperature of the borehole wall, or to the mean fluid temperature, sorry. We started the borehole wall, then we went to the mean fluid temperature. Now we're looking at the exiting temperature from the borehole. 
or the what would be the entering temperature of the heat pump, we still have the temperature rise of the borehole wall due to the heat input. We've got the temperature rise in the fluid due to the borehole resistance. We've got the far field temperature. And then from that, we subtract this delta T over 2, right? Because when it... <coughs> We've uh, said that Q is positive when we're ejecting heat to the ground, right? And when we do that, the, the fluid will come in at a temperature delta T over two above, come into the borehole at a temperature delta T above the, delta T over two above the mean fluid temperature will exit at delta T over two below the mean fluid temperature. So this is our, our prediction of what the uh, temperature difference from the mean fluid temperature to the exiting temperature. All right, and so we could use this expression to calculate the heat pump entering fluid temperature for a fixed heat transfer rate. Okay, it's not so useful for most cases. We could maybe analyze a thermal response test with this approach. All right, but in fact, Q varies with time also. And the way we do this is we we devolve or de perform a deconvolution of the actual load profile into a series of step functions. Um, and we compute the response then for each step function. And then we convolute the individual responses. So in other words, we superimpose the individual temperature responses. This procedure was originally developed by uh, Professor Clausen and his graduate students. And uh, well, we, we still use it today. So if you can imagine, this is just an hourly superposition, but we might, of course, have a much larger time scale. Uh, here, what I've done is I've plotted the heat rejection to the ground, watts per meter. And if you can sort of see the black line would be 20, and then it goes up to 35, and then up to 45, and then back down to 25. That is equivalent to a series of step functions. So the first one is this blue dashed one starting at time zero, and it continues on like this. Now to go from uh, 20 to 35, we have to add a pulse of 15. And if you see this pulse here starting at one hour, you look over here, it's about 15. So that gives us this increase. So the blue dash pulse and the orange dash pulse give us this, this, this. Now, for this section, we need to add another pulse, which is 10 higher, right? So you see this, this pulse at 10 starts here, right? And then when we drop down, we actually have to superimpose a negative pulse, right? A negative 20. So we've dropped down from 45 to 25, and there's our negative 20 right there, right? So that's an idea of how we, uh, you could say, devolve the loads which we assume to have a square profile like this into uh, individual step functions. And then using the line source, for example, or another approach, we can calculate the response. So this would just be the delta T at the borehole wall. So this black line is the overall response, adding everything together. But the blue dashed line here, that would be the response due to that first pulse of 20 watts per meter, right? And then we had to add another pulse with 15 watts per meter, I think, and then another one with 10, and then negative 20, if I remember the numbers right. And when we add these together, we get this kind of profile, right? Sort of looks like, well, sawtooth type of profile. Okay, so again, we take this load input Right? And we find the response to each of the dash step functions, and then we add them up to get the actual response. So how does this work in practice? Well, if you look at um, our expression, now we've just gone back, just look at the borehole wall temperature because we'll add back in the borehole resistance effect and the far field temperature and the delta T across the fluid separately. Right? But if we just look at the what's caused by the history. Right, for the first time interval, 
Now this is now this is actually at the end of the first time interval, right? That the rise in the um, borehole wall temperature is given by this initial pulse times four pi k so or divided by four pi k soil times the exponential integral of rb squared over four alpha soil times this delta t. Right, so that's just what we've been doing all along. But for the second time interval, we have here this portion, right? This is the effect of that first pulse, which now at the end of the second interval has gone two delta t or two hours, right? And then we add the second pulse in. Now the second pulse, right? You remember here it had a value of 15 because this jumped up from 20 to 35. Right? The way we express this is that first pulse lasts the whole however long we're analyzing the problem for. The second one starts, it's going to be one, start have one hour less duration, and it has a value of q2 minus q1. So the diff, it's the difference between the second pulse and the third pulse. I'm sorry, the second pulse and the first pulse. Okay, then for the third time interval, right, we, we just write this out again. Right, we have now that first pulse has been operating for three hours, the second pulse for two hours, and the third pulse, which the step function is going to be q3 minus q2, ah, this should be one delta t, or just delta t. Right, so three delta t, two delta t, one delta t. Right, and q1, q2 minus q1, q3 minus q2. Right, these give us the sort of step functions that make up this final response. Okay, now we don't want to keep writing this out forever and ever, so if we just look at for the nth time interval, right, and if we let q0 be 0, and we could, I guess we could write that in, but so the very first one's q1 minus q0, and we just assume q0 was 0. Right, if we put this in, or this form in a, as a series, Right, we see for the nth time interval, we sum from i equals 1, the first interval, to the nth interval. And the contributions are given just the same way we did here, only in general, right, the number of delta t that we apply, it's n minus i plus 1. Right, so if we're on the third interval, right, then it's 3 minus 3 plus 1. If we're on the first, if we're, if we're on the third interval but analyzing the first pulse right then we have three minus one plus one or three so there's our three delta t and then and our one delta t if we're at the i equals three so that's what's going to give us our temperature rise at the borehole wall and then the exiting borehole temperature right would be given by same expression, right? Only we we're just plugging in delta T n because we don't want to put this summation in. We still have Q times the bo uh, borehole resistance or, okay, so I see there's a slight discrepancy here. I call it RBH. I think I meant to call it RB star. Um, in any case, it sh sh should be either the borehole resistance or the effective borehole resistance. Generally, it would be the effective borehole resistance, which we might uh, approximate with just the borehole resistance if we have a short enough borehole. Right, and then we have this uh, temperature difference um, due to the uh, fluid, uh, or from the mean fluid temperature to the uh, outlet. If we just want the mean fluid temperature and we just have this expression here. Okay, so we're going to pause there. I'll probably fix this in the notes to make it RB star, and uh, then we will pick up, we'll have actually have an example, numerical example. Okay, so let's stop.